All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Resource Insider Podcast, uh, the quarantined edition. We're still all locked at home, and I think this is week seven for me, and I assume everybody else in the world is in a similar boat. Uh, today on the podcast, we've got someone that I had the pleasure to meet probably only about uh, four or five weeks ago. Uh, his name is James Whittle. He is the CEO of Rupert Resources, a exploration slash mine redevelopment company focused on gold in Finland. But James has a very interesting background. He's a geologist by training, but he also spent years as a fund manager focused on the mining space. So we're going to get into all that today. So without further ado, James, thanks for uh, taking the time to chat. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks. Great to participate, Jamie. So where, where are you these days? Are you in London? Do I have that right? Yeah, I'm based, yeah, I, I uh, live just in southwest London. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, I guess that's where I, I'm from, from the UK. I spent a long time in Australia. Um, after I graduated as a geolo young geologist, I went out to Australia and spent eight years out there, but I moved back here in about 2003. So it's been a, a bit of a busy time and a bit of an interesting time in the mining space right now. Uh, I think to some people's shock, we've seen uh, mining, particularly gold companies, take off. A lot of them, particularly the majors and the royalty yeah. companies. Uh, I'd been expecting a big pullback and a, a much slower recovery, but it's really, uh, I found, I, I think it's really exploded over the last month. Have you found that uh, a surge of interest coming into Rupert and what you guys are doing? I think um, I, I think there's certainly a lot more interest in the market. Um, I think um, yeah, we've stepped up some of our marketing, and you're definitely getting a lot of interest um, coming through. Maybe they're not yet starting to buy some of the some of the more junior names like ourselves. But I think this whole um, move with the gold price having this time stayed up all the way through the crisis, effectively it had a shortfall. But I think that's that's given people a lot of confidence to really look into this sector. So you have a, a very interesting uh, and a very, um, I would call it, uh, confidence building background for the CEO of a, of a junior mining company. You're a geologist by training, but you've also worked uh, in finance extensively. Can you, um, I'd like to dig in a little bit to your background, first as a geologist and then the move into finance. And then let's talk about, uh, sort of what we're seeing in the space in general after that. So how, how did you end up transitioning from geologist in Australia to working for, I believe it was Baker Steel Capital Managers, the fund you were with? Yeah, Baker Steel Capital. So I guess, um, I guess stepping back to being that, that young geologist in the field in Western Australia, um, yeah, I was, uh, like many geologists, stuck on, a, on you know, pretty remote projects out in the middle of nowhere. And I... Um, I guess we had a lot of analyst visits, you know, the analysts would fly in, I'd prepare an airstrip and, you know, drive lunch in from 80 k's away. And these guys would literally just fly in. And we'd sort of show them around the site. A few of them would ask some questions. And this was a working on a big Vanadium project at the time. And um, yeah, they would sort of come in, look at some core. Um, yeah, not many of them would actually ask questions and you'd be telling them, giving them all this information, then they'd just get on the plane again and go. <laughs> At the end of the day, you went back to work. So, so obviously that was your, my sort of first introduction to this whole finance analyst side of it. I, I'd, I'd done like applied geology at university, so I had done economic modeling, so I knew it was there, but I guess that was the first interaction. And I, so get, I guess your, that's part of the interest. Was your view there that sort of this looks like a pretty good gig when you're out living outside <laughs> for months at a time and you yeah know. If, if you've been living in a caravan or sleeping on a swag on top of a frame bed for the for the last month and these guys fly and quickly and fly out again yeah you're like yeah, that looks quite good. <laughs> <laughs> so, especially, especially with all due respect some questions weren't yeah that weren't the smartest either so it's like okay yeah so, you know, this is an interesting question because, uh, you know, I was actually in a similar uh, experience. I remember one of my first jobs, I was working in an exploration camp in the Yukon and very similarly people flew in and I'd been there for six or eight weeks at a time and they'd fly in for a day, maybe two on the, on the worst and they'd get wined and dined and take off again. And I just thought, you know, that seems pretty good. Um, and there's a lot of 
there's a lot of uh, young geologists and technical people that listen to these interviews and these podcasts, and I know have been spoken to many of them. A lot of them are trying to consider and plan out the next step of their career, which is maybe how do they take a step into working with one of the banks or, or one of the funds? Uh, how do they get out of the field after having spent potentially a considerable amount of time there into an analyst role or into a finance role? Did, how, did you, how did you end up doing that yourself? I, I guess we were interested. We were doing a feasibility study with a, with Rothschilds. We were involved in that as well, the finances of this project. Mm -hmm. and, and I built up a relationship with one of the people involved and, and was chatting to him about that whole transition. Uh, and basically, the, you know, I had good geology skills, but I didn't know enough about the finance industry. So I ended up going back and doing a master's, effectively an MBA in mining finance in the UK, a uh, mineral project appraisal in, at uh, Imperial College. And, and that... You know, I guess what I think was interesting about that is that some people, left, you know, they hadn't gone into the field and, and didn't really, and, and then they went sort of straight into this. But the advantage for all those geologists in the field and have worked and seen the reality, and I think that's absolutely key that they should try and do that as much as possible. Then you have a lot better understanding of the reality of, of, of things when you start looking at in a, in a finance side as well. So that introduced you to effectively the, the financial markets and investing and, and really getting into the depths of doing analysis and, and that was the most especially the lead-in um, and from there just after I finished that um, I was um, still half living between the UK and Australia and a, and a role came up at Baker Steel Capital Managers and so I, I jumped on that. So uh, what was your role at Bakerfield? You were a a man, you were the managing partner and the fund manager. Were you, were you, you were specifically focused on mining in general or gold or how did that work? Yeah, so I guess I, I joined there obviously not having any experience in the industry. So I effectively joined as an analyst. Um, they were just building up their business uh, really at this early days of Baker Steel. We had a, we had a special, we had the first hedge fund as far as we know in natural resources. So it was a Goldman Sachs product. It was uh, launched as you know, like a third mining equity, third mining equities, a third gold equities, and a third oil and gas. And then we had this growing gold equities business that was coming alongside because the founders of the of the company were from Merrill Lynch, which is obviously BlackRock these days, and they've been running the, the gold funds uh, for many years in Merrill Lynch, and they've basically gone out on their own. So, um, my so I started off as an analyst, and then I guess I was at the firm thirteen years. So you know progressed pretty quickly, we were a small firm, and then took on fund management role after a couple of years. And then we grew that business quite you know, substantially, both the hedge fund product and the long only gold product to be almost $2 billion at the height. So, and you said this was one of the first, or maybe the first hedge fund focused on mining. So how yeah. does that differentiate between, uh, I guess, funds and different investment vehicles that existed that was previously putting capital into the market? Is it just the, you had the ability to go long and short or were there any other differentiators? No, I guess you were ultimately very value driven all the time. So all your long ideas, you were really looking, you know, obviously trying to find the best value stocks. We spent, you know, Baker Steel was founded on the fundamentals of having that and doing a lot of really in-depth analysis of companies. So we had our own proprietary, uh, valuation tool so we were looking at you know at an asset level you know as many assets as we could globally both on the mining and oil and gas side and building up all our own company models so we used research analysts from the sell side but a lot of it was all proprietary but i guess we were we had a pretty broad mandate and the, on the i guess that was always picking the long ideas but picking the short ideas as um you know that was a whole different type. So you might be short the commodity if you thought the equities were overvalued, certainly in the oil space. Um, you might be um, short on stock specific companies, companies that had a history of failing quite a number of times. Um, you tend to find they fail again. <laughs> yeah. So that was the, definitely one angle. So, you know, repetitive, poorly managed companies were, were tended to be your short ideas. So how'd you guys do? Yeah, very well. I mean, the, the, I guess the reality was the hedge fund was very successful. Um, the, the, but I guess we started it in 2002, 2003. Um, and then the market, um, I guess for, for those first few years, we were, a, 
Uh, we had very low volatility and moderate returns, and that was what the hedge funds were built for, weren't they? You know, keep the vol down and generate nice steady returns every year. Then the market became very directional from about 2006 onwards. Um, we had the big pickup in general mining. And then actually, you know, everyone, there were a lot of new hedge funds coming out almost on a weekly basis, but they weren't really hedge funds in the true sense of the words. They were, um, they were pretending to be that to charge two and 20, but effectively long only products. So then yeah. we really, we, we struggled a bit then. And obviously there, because we kept our discipline of keeping the vol low, um, but you have to have high volatility if you're going to be directional. But the market didn't care. Everyone loved for resources, didn't they? So this is kind of, that brings me to a more philosophical question. Do you think, so over the last few years with the, the rise of the ETF and passive investing, we've seen a lot of uh, mining focused hedge funds and all sorts of investment vehicles uh, fold up and die and, and go away. Do you think uh, with what's happening right now, and we can get into that uh, in a bit more detail after this, but do you think, sort of the shift we're going to right now in the world and the, the, what seems to be a focus on gold, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll follow on resources. Do you think we're going to see uh, more hedge funds and more uh, managed capital focused on the mining and gold space pop up again? I think you definitely see money flow back into those funds that existed before, and there's, there's, there's a lot less funds than there were before. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess we'll see how many new funds crop up, but certainly the funds that still exist, so Baker Steel still exists, you know, it's around for, you know, coming up to 20 years, or it's 18 years now. Um, so you're seeing fund flows back into those, those very experienced investors that have been in space for a long time. And I think, I, I know, I, it, there's a, it's a lot easier to invest in this sector than it used to be. You can just buy the GDX or buy the GDXJ or buy an ETF product. Um, I yeah. did it myself to get exposure, uh, you know, at, at sort of short term um, periods because it's so convenient, you know, and your fees on it are so low. Um, and you accept that, you know, when the market's running, it's very, um, you know, the relative outperformance of paying a fund manager might not be that high in some <laughs> cases. Um, so, you know, I, I think, um, yeah, I guess to ask that, I think you will see more funds coming up, but I think the guys that have been in it for the longest, who know the sector very well, will, will really outperform those products. And, and they've had to work a lot. Um, I think, you, you know, with the rise of the ETFs, it's made, if you can't outperform it, you don't, your fund really doesn't have a business model anymore. So you're, you know, you've really got to be truly picking stocks and yeah. really getting into the understanding it better than everyone else. So what, what I have seen succeed though, or what seemed to have gotten more popular in the sector over the last decade, call it, is the, the mining focus private equity firms. That seems to be more uh, in vogue, right? Whether it's yeah. the Orion Capitals or Resource Capital Fund or uh, EMR out of Australia. Do you think that's the future of, uh, of investing in mining? Do you think we're gonna see private equity take a bigger and bigger role or do you think there will be a shift back to hedge funds? I, I'm asking you to speculate here, but I mean, given your experience, I think it's a, uh, it's an interesting yeah, perspective, and it's something I wonder about a lot. I guess we had, there was a, so going back to 2003, there was a rise in hedge fund products investing in the space. They, a lot of the, some were successful, some weren't. Uh, even I wanted Baker Steel, we eventually closed it because we, you know, we couldn't compete. But so then you effectively just went to more simple, long only investing. Um, it was a lot easier to, to market. Um, we did a hybrid one absolute return fund as well, but effectively long only investing was where you were able to, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess continue with the, gather more assets and that allowed you to probably have longer hold positions in stocks. Um, where do we go now with it? I guess it's a case of, of um, with the private equity side. I think the issue for investing in this sector is the, I mean, 
returns. And obviously, they know people maybe returns over three to five years. Now they're probably focusing on three to six months. And so with that, that doesn't fit the industry very well, which is the problem. So private equity funds definitely allow that permanent capital or more permanent capital to do it. I actually think um, investment trusts might come back a bit in vogue because that's even more permanent capital because obviously uh, these PE funds have to, they tend to have maybe a five or 10 year shelf life, but they still have to give the money back at the end of that period. So they have to be able to realize those investments. And that's when it becomes a challenge for them. And they're trying to raise the next money for the next fund. And they're trying to, they've got to get it forced to get off positions when maybe they don't want to. So each of these, I mean, I'm probably not giving a straight answer, but each of the different products has its own strengths and weaknesses. And they yeah. have to effectively pick your investment to meet it. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this over the last couple of years. And it seems to me a lot of the private equity firms have really put themselves in a bad situation because they're not true private equity. But in so far that what you traditionally see in this space of a co of buying a company or a project outright and you know re re you know uh, rejigging everything and improving management all those things you would typically expect, but they go in and they buy a publicly traded company they buy thirty or forty percent of it um, and they have huge positions they have positions that are so big that they can't sell them on the market yet they've effectively suck so much of the value out of that that nobody else really wants to come in because they have so much sway and ownership and they sort of they I, I feel like they 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 make it harder for other investors to come in so they don't have full control they can't get off their position and then they're effectively stuck uh with a company um and in a bad market like we have seen for the last 10 years they're not making any value of it and it might you know when they set these funds up with the 10-year time frame I think at the beginning of a 10 year time frame, it looked like a, that was, would be a really long time and it would easily work out. But we found that so many of them have been stuck in these positions. Uh, I don't know, I mean, it's not really a question, but I just think it's, I, I kind of personally think the only way that model actually works is if they take a big enough position that they own the entire company or project, or they take a small enough position that they're actually able to effectively sell it. And I think a lot of them have gotten themselves stuck somewhere in the middle. I think I think if they um, I think, well if you and if you get stuck somewhere in the middle you're still how do you you know really mark your position to the market or how do you value your position all the time so if you're a P fund and you go into a listed stock and you own thirty for forty percent of it whilst you effectively control it you still don't have a control on the valuation which um, which you're kind of controlling more quasi because you own so much of it um so the the challenge for them is you know how do they then if the they'd be in a much better position if they just did whole own the whole thing or a group of private equities firms whole held held it together so it agreed okay well each of us will own 25 percent or 30 percent of the stock and then sort of manage it between them uh, this whole crossover mode is, is quite dangerous really because you just end up you know, it, it's uh, just end up in a very grey area of evaluation that um, which, which I guess puts off other investors from coming into stocks as well. Um, so if it's part, they, they might actually struggle to get off it because people are like, well, yeah, it's uh, is that the right valuation on the stock to buy it at that point in time, or is it just there because you know effectively these guys control the register? So I think it's a challenge. I, I, I guess it's interesting. Some of the the mining industry has always been a struggle for it because for and it, certainly the exploration because it's existed and it's at the vagaries of the market all the time and it's a capital hungry business. It, there's a lot of argument that certain parts of the mining industry are much more suited to private companies in the first place, entirely private companies. And which which part would that be? Do you think? I, I actually think that well, actually the exploration. Uh, I obviously run a listed exploration company, but actually the exploration industry 
would probably be a lot more efficient in a private company. I mean, just speaking philosophically about it, because obviously then you, um, the issue for exploration companies is this time lag that it takes to take this project from early discovery to, and you're going to have, you know, a lot of, it's a bit of a roller coaster, you know, it is certainly, it's a significant roller coaster in this instance. So, you know, and then if you're relying on a market that sort of comes and goes and likes the sector, doesn't like the sector and is cyclical as well, it, obviously if you, if you manage to time everything exactly with the market and you ride the roller coaster together and your results, it's a fantastic outcome. But obviously if there's any, if that doesn't align, it, it just ends up, you know, sort of pushing against each other. So, you know, for a lot of exploration companies, I know it's, it's nice for them to be able to come to the market and raise equity on a listed market, but actually the, the sort of sticky money you want, that actually might be in the private equity firms, but unfortunately the private equity firms aren't yet, haven't evolved yet to want to buy early, get in earlier stage. They only want to get involved when there's a resource and, you know, it's mm -hmm. got to that stage. So I guess, where's the solution to that? Maybe the private equity firms need to take a higher amount of risk and come in earlier um, to you know, really analyze some of these projects that might be the ones in the future. They'll, they'll see a much higher return if they do that, for sure. Yeah, well, it's interesting, actually, because I'm invested in two uh, prospect generators that are still private, um, and they're actually profitable. So they have gone and done great joint ventures with major companies on big land packages doing true grassroots exploration. One of them here in Canada, one of them actually is doing it now in Kazakhstan. And, uh, you know, the, the JV contracts that they're able to cut pays the bills, pays for their salary. They make a little bit of profit every year. Um, and in the event they, you know, they do make a discovery, uh, they're going to be worth a lot more. And they've, I, it's, it's much different than the traditional public exploration model. It's almost like, it's almost like the majors have just outsourced their exploration department uh, yeah. instead of having it in house. And yeah. I think, I think we're going to see more of it. Uh, but who knows? I think if we get a good bull market on our, on our hands here, we might not see, <laughs> we might not yeah. see it anymore. <laughs> I think people will um, rush into the market and get as much capital as they can. But, yeah. and I think that's the problem. And that's what people at home need to be thinking about is when you invest in a junior company, are they, are they looking for a mine or are they looking for capital from the stock market? And different management teams have different objectives and we're pretty focused on trying to find the ones that are actually looking for a mine as opposed to just looking for money for a, you know, new vacation house perhaps. <laughs> um, so I think we yeah, should shift always, the conversation. You know, as a, as a cynical, uh, but, but I, I guess as a finish, as a cynical fund manager on the other side, you, you, you always, uh, um, we never used to go to things like PDAC and things like that because we were just like, there's just all these people just want you to write them a check. Uh, uh, and, um, and most of it because they just want to buy the market. For, you know, they, this, they have some great ideas and some great things that they'd like to do but they're not really offering you any return on that money that you're going to give them or very little, or maybe a lottery ticket style return. And I think that's, you know, that's the, there's a danger in some ways that the market gets, um, has a big run again. And that, that allows that to work. Some people make money, but a lot of people lose money. The chance of making money in expiration are pretty small. Um, when you go back and look over the, over a longer period of time um, by doing it that way. So, yeah, I think it's, um, as you say, it, it's, a, it's about trying to back companies that have something real and are going to get into actually you know, trying to find something real that's going to be a deposit of the future that is um, ultimately going to make their shareholders a good amount of money and, and uh, whoever buys it potentially. So on that note, I think that's a good transition. You left uh, Baker Steel after, I think you said, 13 years there to go and run an exploration company, R Rupert Resources. So presumably you had a lot of opportunities or a lot of job offers to leave uh, throughout your career there. Why is it that you decided uh, when you did and specifically why did you decide to go and run Rupert? What was the, what was the incentive there for you? I guess a couple of things. I, I've sort of been looking at it or considering it for a while to go back into industry. You've seen hundreds of companies 
companies all the time and you keep on reviewing projects and there's a certain um while you're reviewing tangible things you, you, you're not any longer getting your hands dirty you don't really get into the detail of the projects um when, as a fund manager um and so i yeah i was looking at something if there was if there was something in a really good jurisdiction so you know what makes a good at a good company is expected to be a good very very good jurisdiction um an asset that's got some tangible value that someone's acquired for nothing and um on top of that you know the potential that there's a lot more there i mean there's already evidence that there's quite a lot of gold at part of our but you know recently you know we see a lot of evidence particularly in this project that there's you know some other really big projects in the belt but there's not that many of them but geologically there's no reason why there wouldn't be more so it's about putting all those things together and obviously then building a team around that to do it um but but one of the other things is that you, you're trying to find a company that's 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 well funded and that's you have to find a company that's got the right backers behind it as well because you might have a great idea but if you can't fund it um, at the bottom of the market or through tough times that's going to be a struggle so that was important as well to have a company that you know had a good balance sheet had a good you know they hadn't didn't already had a million a billion shares out at that point in time and you could actually take it and, and do something with it so you guys have got a, a very large land package there almost 300 square kilometers you've got some great neighbors uh you're right next door uh, to Ignico Eagle, I believe, uh, and is it an Anglo? Does Anglo have pro projects around you as well? So Anglo American has the properties to the east of us. Yeah. They, um... So the, for people who have not heard of Rupert, for people who are maybe totally unfamiliar with mining in Finland, can you give us the thirty thousand foot view of what's interesting about it and what investors, why investors should be interested in Rupert? Yeah. So, so I guess just. Finland and why you should be interested in that geologically. You, you mentioned Kittler, Agnico's mine. Uh, you know, that's 8 million ounces roughly in the ground now. Europe's largest gold mine. It has um, been ticking along very nicely in the last few years. They're just expanding it as well, putting in a big underground shaft. So, it, and it's, it's going to be there for tens of years going forward. It's a huge deposit. That's to the to the west of us and then to the east of us you have anglo-american sagati project uh, one of the best uh, base metal discoveries nickel copper pgm discoveries of the last 20 years discovered in 2009 um, it's not really that known about because um, it's in a big portfolio of anglo-american projects but you know that that just proves there's some big projects in the belt but for the gold side ultimately um, I think it's it's a bit like stepping back a hundred years in the Abitibi. Really, you've got all this. There's some interesting information, but you've never had a real prospector environment here. So, whilst there's been government work and academic work here showing it's interesting, there's never been any commercial geology really exploration done. So that's the opportunity through the through the entire belt. And I guess between ourselves and our neighbours, we've already been in very short order over two years, showing that it's very prospective. So. You know, you know, so the key reason why I look at it, it's incredibly prospective. It, it's just been ignored somewhat. A big reason for that, it was in the EU, till, well, it wasn't in the EU, sorry, until the mid 90s. So international companies just couldn't work here. It was all state owned. Um, so it's really been an, a sort of overlooked up until this point. But I don't think that's the case anymore with Kinross and B2 Gold here and, and others, obviously, um, looking in the belt. So, so that's. That's a key reason why you should look at it and take an interest in. Um, and then at Rupert itself, well, um, the key differentiator and why you should look at us in the belt is that we, whilst there's a gold mine at Kittler, we own the only other one that's developed and built in the belt at part of Ara um, that was discovered in the 80s. It's really been a, always considered of a small asset um, and it's had production on and off for 15 years. But um, it's there, it's fully permitted. You could turn it on tomorrow if you wanted to, but they never, no one ever really took time to understand the deposit and the potential. And what we've been doing over the last couple of years is showing that it's, well, demonstrating that, that the previous owners didn't understand that this was probably a million ounce deposit from the get go, compared to always thinking it was a 150,000 ounce deposit, something small and you shouldn't worry about. So I think, uh, 
you know, between that and our other discoveries, it makes it very relevant today. And do you have a resource on the deposit now, currently? Yeah, we did one back in 2018, about a year after I joined, and we lifted it from 150,000 ounces to just under half a million ounces at 3.2 grams um, inferred resource. And we just, did that, that's at the mine itself. Uh, we've just done, well, it's about 17,000 meters now of regional exploration on new targets and got five new discoveries outside the mine but we just finished doing 7,000 meters out of the mine and we'll do, and put a new resource on that um, in the next few months. Ahead. And so last I checked, you got your market cap was just over a hundred million dollars, right? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that's not a cheap market cap for, that's not a cheap price for an exploration project for investors that are thinking or looking to allocate capital into the gold space. You know why is Rupert a good option? Where where do they where do they have to go up from here? Is there some sort of value add catalyst that they can expect over the coming six months to a year yeah, that I, I is guess going to take that from a hundred million to two hundred million? Yeah. So so um, so if you, I guess I look at it from a fund manager's hat. So the, the the whole thing about these businesses is you have to acquire the assets right at the bottom. So we bought the whole asset package. You know, three hundred square kilometers of land permitted mine and mill um, for just two and a half million dollars. So that's obviously your base load, but you know, the replacement cost of the mine and mills, $120 million. Um, there wasn't any resources. Now there's, you know, well, you know, there's already half a million ounces um, and just at the mine and that's potentially growing. So I think if you just looked at the potential for developing the mine that we have now and some of the discoveries at, even at the mine, you know, you start to, you know, get to a valuation that, you know, probably isn't far from where we are today. So that's sort of your fundamental value. And, and the risk and I guess the, the risk of buying expiration stocks and, and obviously is that there is no downside protection. So if you buy a share, but if you buy a share of Rupert Resources today, um, you have the downside protection that we already have that. It's, um, you know, often, you know, people's Again, say so buying expiration stocks is buying a lottery ticket. But if you don't win on the lottery, you throw it up and throw it away and put it in the bin. You know, if if um, we have some ups and downs in expiration, you've still got a value in your ticket that you bought in the first place. Um, so you've you've got that that fundamental asset backing to to a, to the shares. Yeah. And then, uh, so yeah. sorry. So you have the historic mine. You obviously have the infrastructure. The plan is to continue drilling, continue to grow the resource. The goal, I think you mentioned, is to get it up to north of a million ounces. Oh, I lost you there, Jamie. Sorry, I'll, I'll repeat that again. So you've got the historic mine. You have all the infrastructure. Um, I think the goal, as you stated it, was to continue drilling uh, build up the resource, hopefully get that to north of a million ounces. Is is that what investors should expect over the next, uh, I don't know how long, a year or two uh, as your goal? Yeah, I, I th I th our goal is it, the goal is probably a bit more stretched than that, really. We, we look at part of our uh, today as, you know, one asset amongst many that we own in the, in the, in the company. So I mean, part of our it is ultimately to show, demonstrate the economic upside of part of our and what that could be, both you know, low capital restart of this and the sort of cash flow it can generate. That's one. In terms of the scale of the resource, and I guess, again, a sort of comment from a fund manager side, we don't, we're looking for assets of scale, but at the same time, we're looking for ounces that you can make money on rather than just ounces in the ground. So, you know, whilst at part of our, we, May only have half a million ounces now. If those half a million ounces can generate, you know, like a twenty-five percent margin, that's exceptional in this business. So, we'll be, you know, our aim over the next six to twelve months is to demonstrate that at the mine, and then of what the, what could be the economic margin on those ounces, and then uh, and the potential for there. But at the same time, if you step back from the mine, you know, a year ago we we approached the shareholders and said, you know, we see a lot more upside beyond the mine. So we um, agreed to do the basically the first exploration here regionally, and within a year 
we've made five significant discoveries and we've still got drills turning now um, in the field on targets. We have 25 targets that we brought into the company that we assessed on the licenses and those have been delivering. And it's all about, you know, I think there's a lot more upside to be had in terms of the scale of this opportunity than just that you can, that you see it, the one line. I think you're going to see. Uh, and, and how do you, how do you envision sort of the value add of those, of those discoveries and the targets you're exploring? Is the ideal potential that they're close enough that they could be satellite pits to the existing mine if and when it gets turned back on? Or does it make, or is it potential they're standalone deposits or they get sold to one of the surrounding companies? How does that sort of play into the strategy? I guess um, maybe, maybe it's worth just uh, stepping back and a bit about the philosophy of how we approach them, um, each of those things and how we're looking for these other uh, projects. Um, when we when we look at the license as a whole or the opportunity in Rupert Resources, it, if you just think about it as a portfolio of projects or a portfolio of assets, so you might have a stock portfolio, of, you know, 15 to 20 stocks. Um, you do a lot of time and spend a lot of time researching them, deciding which one you're going to allocate capital to, which one's going to make the most return. So I basically look at Rupert Resources in a similar manner, and that's how we've planned where we're going to take the company so we um right at the beginning we spent a long time not actually drilling any holes doing all the desktop work using all the historic data working out if there really was an opportunity one across the whole thing are we going to be able to find new things find new things and then we found then we generated maybe 15 targets so they were your 15 things in your portfolio um that you've decided that you might invest in and then we started allocating capital very, um, uh, I guess, on a very risk averse manner, effectively, just say, OK, well, let's go and initially test some of these targets and see whether they, you know, they have the potential. Because where you see this over the long term, what do we want to create? Now you want to, the idea was that for the parts of our mind is that that's your way of unlocking all the value of the things that you find, because you don't need to build another mine, another processing facility you can use everything, the infrastructure we have. So there's no big capital number required. It's okay, so, so that's your way of unlocking everything you find. So that's, and so let's go and find all these assets that could potentially come through that mill. So certainly as you allude to, a, that being a central processing plant, or if you look at that, or your processing facility for things that you find it is key. But then, um, you know, the way we, you know, we, we just steadily all asset allocate to those projects and see how they develop. Um, and I think you're, you're seeing that in the way we've done it really, because we've tested probably in the region of seven or eight targets and we select of those five have become, you know, they've all got significant drill hits in and they, we think each one of those certainly is going to have some sort of resource on it that potentially could be economic. So, you know, we just steadily asset, you know, and, and then we continue to evaluate, well, you know, you know, are they going to be good enough that we can truck them back to the mill? They're only 15, 20 kilometers away, so for sure. Um, but, you know, one of those may well get so big that it has a life of its own and wants to uh, have its own facility. You know, that's a really big upside opportunity that, that I don't think uh, that obviously is, is yet identified, but I still see it as a great opportunity here. Is there, um, for investors thinking about this, is there a comparison uh, to Rupert, to other companies in the past. I mean, what comes to mind for me uh, when you're talking about this a little bit is Integra Gold and the project they had in Quebec built around a mill. I think they sold it to El Dorado for something on the order of half a billion dollars after, mm -hmm. after sort of re-exploring, redeveloping it. Is that, if not the comparison, maybe something along the lines of the inspiration for, for a company like this? Yeah, I th I th you know, they did a fantastic job of moving that company forward. And, and that whole point, I've been to Valdor and, and even visited the Sigma Lamac mill as an analyst when they were doing other things. I was like, yeah, anyway, I didn't invest in that. We, we invested in Integra, but we didn't invest in the, in the previous owners. But th that was exactly it. I mean, they had that mill, they had all that infrastructure and that way to do it. And then they recognized that, you know, there was the potential for new deposits here. And obviously they demonstrated that with triangle and all the things that they went on to find. 
and what made it so attractive and this is this metrics how do you make money in exploration you, you have to you have to explore in a pretty timely manner manner and control the amount of money you spend and I always, I always say to the guys don't carry on spending money if it doesn't feel right or smell right you've got to stop early because this business spends too much time losing money and falling in love with projects but just keep on <laughs> working on the best projects but don't but at the same time you know it's um it's uh it has a lot of analogy it is this whole analogy to the whole financial you just keep on allocating to that so so you you know they what did they do they demonstrated a growing ever growing amount of ounces very close to an existing mill and that you know i don't know i wouldn't be able to say how much they spent per ounce but your aim is you don't want to be spending any more than maybe 30 dollars an ounce you know the, the market you know, when it's very efficient finds economic ounces were about 30 or 40 dollars an ounce you know those guys then went on to sell integra affected for evaluation of, of you know well north of 100 or 150 dollars an ounce on the ounces they discovered so they turned you know those that 30 dollars into 150 dollars for those shareholders like in terms of the mm. asset that they had that in terms of the money that they spent they spent raised that money spent it and they made that much of a multiple on it which is you know while that you know why they're it's very high regarded as a as a as a return that was made so that's the maths it's a case of you've got to make sure that you efficiently explore these things and can you turn you know find things for ten dollars or twenty dollars or thirty dollars and because you have a mill sell them for at a premium um, the challenge for the the explorers that don't have a mill is that how do you get a multiple on that 30 because Good producers can find assets at thirty dollars an ounce. Um, the difference, but if you if you find if you spend thirty finding and then you have to build your own mill and do that, well, you quite be, you pretty quick, quickly get to your one hundred and fifty. So there's no upside left. Um, yeah. So it's a, yeah, that's the challenge. All right, James. Uh, this conversation has gone longer than I thought it would because <laughs> normally we've had them to be about 20 minutes, but this has been really good and we've had a lot to chat about. Uh, but I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, is there anything else that viewers, uh, investors, potential investors should be thinking about with respect to Rupert before we say goodbye? And also, uh, where's the best place for them to learn more on, on your website or to contact uh, you or your team? I, I think um, I guess a couple of things just about the company about it's just the the way we try and run it is obviously and I've said it enough times it's, just, it's you're trying to husband the capital that's been raised um, and be very systematic and disciplined about how you run the company um, you know it and uh, you know through that by you know getting a good method to a team hopefully generate results we've been generating very good results that probably haven't been picked up we haven't been doing an a lot of marketing but you'll see a lot more of that anyway but we wanted to make sure we had a, a company that was in a very i guess a very strong fundamentals before we went out and started marketing it too much um the um in terms of finding out more obviously we have our, our website rupertresources.com um and uh, that's just being revamped and we will be continuing to do some some webinars and updating people and and I bring some of the releases to life. I think it's quite hard for these exploration companies to, to explain what they're trying to achieve. And we'll be doing a lot more explanations of that rather than just putting out, you know, individual drill results and over the, you know, and, and really showing what, what that could turn into, I think is important. Translating what does, um, you know, 30 meters at one and a half grams actually mean to the, the investor. I think you, you'll see a lot more of that. So, yeah encourage people to get in touch look on the website and follow some of the links there to see what we've got all right guys thanks for listening that was james widall from rupert resources and you can find them at rupertresources.com very simple uh thank you very much for listening i know we probably had some internet uh cutout issues on this one uh, very much apologize for that. I have upgraded my internet twice during quarantine and I still can't seem to get fast enough internet, but I think the great content helps make up for it. So James, thank you very much for sitting down and chatting. Very, very much appreciate your time. Uh, thank you very much, Jamie. Much appreciated. Have a good day. All right.
Talk to you soon. <laughs>